So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Wyeth um, and welcome everybody. And uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Zach. So Zach Bowling is the president of our City of Alameda Democratic Club, and we are super excited to have the honor of Pamela Price joining us as our guest speaker today. And I just want to welcome each and every one of you and um, encourage you to think about thoughtful question to ask Ms. Price. Um, she has a weighty new responsibility, and we're just delighted to welcome her back after receiving our endorsement. And um, I would like to encourage each of you, if you are not already City of Alameda Democratic members, to join. It's not that expensive, and if money is a problem, you can just contact me at wyethmc at gmail.com, and we can talk about how to help you become a member. Um, and it's your chance to have a major influence on who we endorse for candidates, as well as a method to become informed, better informed by um, issues that are facing our community. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ryan Lalonde, Lalonde excuse me, um, who will introduce our speaker today. And Ryan, if you could take it away. Sure. <clears throat> so I have the, the privilege and honor to host tonight and have a dialogue with um, someone I consider not only my boss, uh, but my friend. Um, I am the VP of uh, programs for the, the club and a newly elected uh, school board member here in Alameda. And for full disclosure, I am also uh, the former communications director for Pamela's campaign and the current uh, director of communications for the DA's office. So this may seem like I am planted here to have this conversation, but um, I felt like I was the best person to ask those questions that I know that she can answer. Um, and Pamela has no idea what I'm gonna ask her. So I know she's nervous because um, she knows that I, am on the, I can be very spontaneous. Um, for those who do not know our district attorney, uh, Pamela Price was elected um, in a historic win in the last election. Uh, she is our first African American and uh, uh, first African American district attorney for the the uh, county of Alameda, um, and she always likes me to add the first black woman. Um, and so uh, we look, it is a historic moment for all of us. And um, she comes from a background where she has always been a fighter. Uh, from uh, fighting her way out of foster care and the criminal justice system as a youth to finding her way to Yale, to fighting for um, uh, campuses free of sexual harassment and being one of the only people to, uh, the first person to utilize Title IX and to get uh, protections on school uh, college campuses. Uh, back in, uh, she'll tell me the date later, I always forget it, in the uh, long time ago, 70s. And, um, and then she moved here to the Bay Area to attend law school and, um, and has been planted here ever since working for, and for the people of the county, uh, doing uh, mostly civil rights work around workplace discrimination, a lot around domestic violence and women and children's rights. And, um, and she first ran for the district attorney in 2018 against her predecessor um, and then came back uh, and did it again in 2022, this time victorious. So um, Pamela, I want to give you a moment to say something and then I'm gonna go right into questions. Thank you, Ryan. And thank you, Alameda Democrats for inviting me back. You've been on this journey with me and it has been a journey. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I am your district attorney whom the overwhelming majority of this county elected with support across the county from Alameda to Livermore to Dublin through Castro Valley. And all of you probably know that yes, Ryan was very much a part of that effort. Many late nights were spent, uh, but we defeated the opposition, which was a huge step forward for Alameda County. And I'm really proud of the effort that everybody made. And I thank you all. And I'm proud of our county because we 
we knew that there was a better way for us to have criminal justice administered in this county. And we took that opportunity. So we're, we're moving forward and I'm glad to be here tonight. Happy to take your questions. I have no idea what Ryan's going to ask me, <laughs> but we'll, we'll go through it. <laughs> so thank you all. Let's, let's, let's have a conversation. Thank you. So I figured I would start with the office first, and then after that, we could then move back historically and look at the politics and the, and the election cycle. So mm -hmm. the first question that I came up with, and also realized that I did not think that I was going to be doing this, I thought someone else would do it, but um, so I just came up with some questions. Um, what surprised you the most in your first week as you came into that office? Hmm. Um, I think... Uh... What surprised me the most was the level of uh, disconnect between the administration of the office and the staff. Um, that was really surprising to me. I'm a manager, having managed an office for more than 30 years. I and I work from a team perspective and I'm used to engaging people and it was really shocking uh, to find out how that office had been run and that there was such a, a, a level of disconnect for the staff. That was really surprising to me. Uh, do you have any specific examples? I mean, I know one, but <laughs> that I think is really big, but do you have any examples in that? Well, we came in, we had a transition team. Uh, uh, my transition team was 28 people. My predecessor's transition team was four people, including herself. And this is an organization that has 450 employees. So they didn't have an HR department, which I thought, how do you hire and manage people and you don't have performance standards or procedures or Nothing, as Ryan pointed out, I, I was part of the early movement in, 19, in the 1970s to ensure that grievance procedures existed at universities so that women who experienced sexual harassment had an opportunity, had a process by which they could file a complaint. There was no such process in the DA's office. So the lack of structures and infrastructure was very surprising to me. Yeah. We were planning to do a lot more and then all of a sudden we got there and we said, oh, we have to work on the foundation of this house before we can continue to rebuild. Um, I think a good example also would be uh, what I like to call the water scandal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you want to tell everybody about water in our office? Sure, yeah. We found that when people come to court, and these are you know witnesses or victims, they come to court, we are not, uh, the victim advocates were not able to have water in the office. If they wanted to be able to give people just a glass of water, they had to buy the water themselves and bring it to the office. And when we said, okay, well, let's get a water cooler. So, you know, people can have water, people need water. We were told, oh no, that's not allowed. We're not allowed to have water in this office, which was crazy, right? <laughs> We found pockets of people, and Ryan can attest to this in his department, people who didn't know who their supervisors were. Some of them, their supervisors had quit before we got there and they didn't know it. <laughs> so they didn't know who their supervisors were. So we, we found a number of situations across the organization where that existed. It was very, um, very challenging. So you were able to um, bring in a team with you during the campaign. One of the things you said, which was, if I win this, don't just walk me up to the door. You need to walk in with me. Um, tell me about the team that you assembled that walked in with you. And you don't have to plug me. Yeah, right. don't plug him. I insisted that Ryan come. I insisted that some very um, awesome lawyers come. I brought in a team of we have two chief deputies. Previously, there were two, but you probably only heard about one. But in fact, there were two. Um, and I brought in four uh, senior assistant deputies to work with us. So we work as a team. I also brought in uh, a mental health specialist, a clinician. 
uh, and she really helped us tremendously um, to our, some people's surprise, I, I knew that we needed her. Um, so we brought in communications, we brought in mental health, we brought in community engagement people, um, two people that were active in the community that I wanted to make sure that one, from the beginning, that we were about being connected to our community. And they have been busily running around the county and <laughs> talking to different community organizations and nonprofits and, and helping us to build out some of the new initiatives that we're gonna bring to, to bear. For the audience that might not know, tell us a little bit about the, the various structures that exist. I think that when you think about our office that you, you think attorneys and the staff that, that, that prosecute, but it's a lot more holistic than that. Can you describe a little bit about our office structure? Sure, we have technically nine locations, eight of them where people are actively working. Uh, there are four major courthouses around the county. There's the Wiley Manual Courthouse, which is in uh, downtown Oakland. There's the uh, Renee C. Davidson Courthouse, which is the big white building that people see a lot of courts there. But then there's also a major complex for courts in Dublin uh, that's called the Echo J Courthouse. Then there's another courthouse in Fremont. Um, and then we have the Family Justice Center, and we have an office where victim uh, witness advocates work. So there are, a lot, and we have a juvenile hall and juvenile justice division. Um, so the office is, has been organized around locations. Uh, it does have a, a division that you would consider the criminal prosecution division. It also has a division, oh, I forgot Oak Court, <laughs> which is Commute Consumer Environmental Worker Protection Division. Um, that is a location where there are about 30 inspectors and almost 20 lawyers and staff. So you have about 50 people at one office in the community. That division does civil litigation, some uh, criminal prosecution, but primarily civil litigation. So consumer environmental worker protection, fraud, uh, real estate fraud, um, auto theft, um, elder abuse, and workers uh, welfare fraud. Um, so there, that's another major location. So you have a number of major locations around the county. And it's been organized between the consumer environmental as the civil division and the criminal prosecution. The victim witness advocates have been scattered, uh, even though it's a separate division, they've been scattered throughout the county. We just finished our first ever survey of the victim witness advocates. So we could find out what do you need to serve the public? You are often, they are often the first line of defense, having more uh, contact and certainly providing a greater service to victims and survivors of crime than even the lawyers do. And so we wanted to find out how is this working for you all? How, what else do you need? Um, and we found, you know, some pretty surprising things, uh, some basic things like water, uh, some major things like the cost of parking and transportation around the county, which is not covered. These women, primarily women, some men though, but primarily women are paying out of their pocket to go and um, provide services to victims. And uh, so there's, there's a lot of improvement in that area. And we're looking at, as you may have heard, the public accountability uh, units. And we've got a lot of opportunities to realign some things in the county. Absolutely. So one of the divisions that um, it was uh, interesting to meet everybody and, and see and greet was also a division that you convened together and they had never really met as a group before. And that would be, or at least the Echo J um, office. And that would be the inspectors. Can you tell a little bit about our inspectors? Sure, I met the inspectors. It actually was at the Oakport office. They had not had a meeting at that office of all of the inspectors, about 30 in five years. So <laughs> we convened a meeting 
so we could talk to them and they could meet me and they could meet my new chief of inspectors. And we're doing that around the county and we're trying to do uh, bigger gatherings now where people can actually see each other. They can see the leadership. Uh, we just completed, not in addition to the victim witness advocates, we did a survey of all the employees in the office. And we learned that one of their biggest needs was not only was staffing, that the office is very woefully understaffed, but also communication, that they weren't getting um, you know, direction or feedback from the administration. And so we're really working on both of those things. One of the uh, key components in that uh, communication that was interesting, I think, for us in the first week was that there was only one person in the entire office and it wasn't the DA that could send an all employee email. <laughs> Right. So we had to correct that very quickly so that Pamela could communicate with people. Um, very archaic in that regard. Um, I added a question in here that's probably relevant now since we're talking about it. Um, what do our inspectors do? So the inspectors actually, the inspector division was created by Earl Warren. Uh, he had this idea that he wanted to have his own inspectors, and that's like 1939. So they started as a small division, and now it has grown. It's a major uh, component of the DA's office. And the inspectors provide support to local law enforcement when it's appropriate. The inspectors are available in terms of emergencies. You know, if we have uh, incidents where more law enforcement is needed, the inspectors are available. Um, they also assist the prosecution, the lawyers, as we prosecute cases, as we gather evidence. Um, we've utilized them a lot to help us identify uh, survivors and victims of crime when we've needed to try to find people. They've, they've done an excellent job uh, for us for that. Um, some of them provide security for me, which is completely new and unexpected, but appropriate, apparently. Um, so they, they're they very busy. They do the auto theft. They do um, different investigations for some of the civil cases, like the environmental um, division uses them. There are, like I said, the entire division or half the division is located in the community connected to the Consumer Environmental Worker Protection Unit. Um, I think one of our, uh, our, I wouldn't say fears, but one of our apprehensions coming in to the office was that uh, we were outsiders coming into this office for many people and we were afraid that how we wouldn't be welcome necessarily. And um, I think that I found quite the opposite, that people were ready for something completely different. And, um, and I think we struck a chord with them. Um, have you, how have you felt about like, um, I mean, there are people who have been coming to us saying, I've been wanting to have a meeting with the DA in order to amend this relationship. Like, what have you seen when it comes to the welcomingness that we've actually felt, surprisingly, we thought? Yeah, I think myself, my team and I, we all came in with an open mind, with open arms and an open heart. We didn't come into it bitter and resentful. We came in, okay, we're here. Let's figure out what you guys are doing and how we can make it work. And I think people, I know people appreciated that. And I think they perceived that, that we were in fact, you know, um, regular people who just wanted to have a better criminal justice system. And so the reception we got, I mean, there are some people who were so wedded and so ideologically opposed to change, um, but most of those folks are, you know, in the, in the legal, <laughs> in the deputy ranks. I mean, I think, you know, the staff and the working people who, who have to really carry the ball at that office, they weren't hostile toward us at all. And it's been uh, it's been a really refreshing experience. I, I would say that also um, re mending relationships with cities, and I think that maybe Alameda might be a good example of that. Do you have any story around that? Sure, I have. Was delighted to meet with your city attorney who prosecutes misdemeanors and has had, I will to put it tactfully, a challenging relationship with our district attorney's office. And so we were delighted to sit down with him and everything he said, we said, yes, 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 we will do that, yes. We don't have a problem 
problem with allowing your lawyers to be part of our training and with sharing our resources and working together, collaborating to make sure that the filings are done, you know, consistently. We just said yes to everything. And he was very thankful and grateful. And so it's been like that a lot. We've had to reset a lot of the relationships that, you know, have been frayed or damaged in, in the past. Um, so one of the first things our office has announced um, as we kind of uh, at, will be clear that our transition was uh, th did not really exist with the previous administration. So our first day in the office, we began really a transition as we found out what we inherited. Um, and so one of the first things that we're able to announce was that we created uh, the Civil Rights Bureau and under which we had a public accountability unit created. Um, do you want to tell folks a little bit about that unit and its focus? Sure. Um, the public accountability unit, hang on, I need to adjust my battery here. It's having some issues. Um, turn that on. Okay, it's not allowing me to do that. Um, Hang on, I want to put that on. Yes. Um, the public accountability unit was um, intended to address one of the major issues in this county, which is the lack of po police accountability. Uh, but across the county, I did hear people talk about as well, um, you know, public officials not being held accountable and some abusive uh, conduct. We knew that uh, the, for instance, the city manager of Fremont is being prosecuted. We no lost her. <laughs> Sounds like her, maybe her battery died. <laughs> I think she'll come back. Um, <clears throat> What I'll do is I'll fill in a little bit of time. I'm I'm pretty uh, clear also what the public accountability unit does. Um, and then it's been also in the media a lot lately because that we have, I mean, the, the goal was something that Pamela ran on in her campaign uh, about making sure that we have that accountability. And, and we have seen recently, um, just last week with Tyree Nichols in Memphis, how important it is that we hold um, everyone accountable for their misconduct, but also the the extra accountability that we have to give those who are supposed to protect and serve. Um, and for me, it was pretty striking in that um, Tyree is a coworker of my two nephews um, who work side by side him in the facility who look and are the same age, have the same likes and have the same commute home. And it really struck close to home that it could have just as easily been them on, on their way home from work that night. And um, and I think that the this county has asked for, we have a lot of examples of that from Oscar Grant to Steven Tyler's death, um, where we wanted accountability and we are expecting our uh, district attorney's office to kind of follow through on that. So when it came to that unit, I'm trying not to give away too many of her things. Um, uh, she, you know, one, I one of the- <laughs> my, my, my equipment is failing me. I apologize. I'm gonna switch as soon as I can figure out how to get this. Don't phone. worry, Ms. Price. Ryan is gonna gonna do some filler while you get all plugged in. Go ahead, <laughs> Ryan. Thank you. <laughs> I explained why we created the unit and how it, uh, it it came along with your camp, uh, campaign promises and, and the need, particularly as we're um, watching things play out with Tyree Nichols. Um, but uh, I know that recently uh, we uh, brought back um, eight uh, cases into our office. Do you want to explain uh, what? We're not going to be specific about the cases because once a case is open, uh, the office doesn't really comment on them, but we can talk about why we were bringing back cases in general. Sure. Um, I think, again, it's important for us to demonstrate that there is accountability for police officers across the board. So we didn't target just one city and we wanted to make sure that we weren't perceived as targeting one place. 
um, that we looked across the county and that it's not just, uh, the issues are not just generic to one department per se, um, but that the question of whether people, how police officers respond to people with mental illness, how police officers respond to people who are unarmed. And some of the cases were particularly egregious, uh, some of the older ones, because the statute of limitations is a factor, of course. And so you really have to look at what, how egregious the facts were. And so we determined that it was important for us to start with a body of work that the unit could look at. The fact that we are investigating doesn't mean that we're prosecuting necessarily. It means that we're taking another look because that's where we felt duty bound to do that. Um, and that's part of the mandate after all. I think one of the key things in that too that I think the general public doesn't really know and I was even surprised by is that when those cases are closed by the DA's office, all the evidence goes back to the police department. And so in order for us to have a real robust look at those um, cases, uh, we have to call the evidence back. And in the eyes of who we're asking for the evidence from, it, that looks like we're reopening them. So let's just call a thing a thing and we reopened uh, to look at them. Uh, yeah. Speaking, um, so a lot of, we, we receive a lot of praise and a lot of criticism when we did that. Um, and I think one of the questions that arises is, what has your relationship been with uh, police chiefs since you've come into office? So I explained to people when I was running, I'm the, I was the only candidate who's both represented police officers and sued police officers. So I have had that dual kind of relationship where I understand the role of police officers in particular situations as it comes, uh, as it affects public safety. I also understand the obligation uh, for law enforcement to act in accordance with the law and to hold them accountable for, um, you know, adhering to the Constitution. And so as I've stepped into this role, I'm not uncomfortable engaging with the chiefs across the county, which I've done. Um, I've gone to multiple meetings. I'm part of the Alameda County Association of Police Chiefs and Sheriffs, and we've had a fairly, you know, robust dialogue about what it means to now have a progressive prosecutor in the midst <laughs> and uh, that, you know, they should be direct with me and I will be direct with them. And um, so we've had some conversations around the reopening of those cases. I wanted to be respectful of their role. And I think that they've been nothing but cordial and respectful towards me. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there was a KQE, there was a KQED article this last weekend um, mm -hmm. that quoted your predecessor's predecessor, uh, former DA Orloff, um, and he brings up the fact that um, because of your public accountability unit, that um, it sends a message that we're questioning everything. And he he says, quote, um, this was in reference to the idea that. Uh, there might be a revolt against you and they would start de-policing. De -policing. Um, and his quote was, I mean, if everything you do is going to be questioned, then maybe it's easier to ride around in your car for eight hours and then just go back to the station and go home. Um, so how, how do you feel okay. about it? There you go. Um, how do you feel about a lot of people will call, talk about the deep policing that happened in San Francisco and say, are you afraid that's going to happen to you, to you here? Um, and I know that you, I'm, I think I lost you. Um, I know that a lot of people uh, will say that, you know, that will happen here. But what is your response to that? I don't know if you heard all that. Charles. <laughs> we'll see if we get her back. Oh, there she is. Okay. Are you okay. unmuted? Oh, you're not unmuted. Oh, there you go. Thank you. No, I had to switch off because I didn't want to lose you all again. Um, my response, which is what I said this morning, it is critical that police officers do their job. Um, 
I don't get to not do my job because I don't like what the mayor of San Leandro says or does, <laughs> or I don't like what the board of supervisors says or does. My responsibility is to do my job and police officers have that same obligation and commitment. And it's a management issue. So there's two, two major actors that influence how police respond in the manner in which you, you've described, Ryan, that whether they're not going to do their job because they don't like what the DA says or does, or they don't like how justice is being administered. One is the leadership of the department in and of itself, and that leadership has an obligation uh, to manage the department. That's fundamentally their responsibility. And if officers are not doing their job, that's a disciplinary matter. And it's a failure of the management that cannot, um, you know, govern, essentially govern the department. The, the pressure where we see that, that those issues arise comes typically from the Police Officers Association, the POAs that are political organizations acting in a political manner and influencing their members to act in an inappropriate political manner and it undermines public safety. And I believe that most police officers that took an oath to just like I did to defend um, and obey the constitution, that they're prepared to, to live up to that oath. And if they are in fact committed to public safety, then the notion that they should somehow stop doing their job because they don't like the politics that that's not something that that i think they would buy into so another announcement that was made last week was um the creation of the office's first mental health commission um mm -hmm. you mentioned you mentioned this on the campaign trail that you would be creating uh, such commissions to help advise you tell us a little bit about um I know that I also saw some names in here of some folks that are on the commission. So that's uh, hello to Kimberly and folks. Um, how, uh, tell us what the role of the commission will be and, 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 and why it's so important to have these voices as we uh, reshape how we address mental illness in the county. Yeah, one of the commitments that I made during the campaign was that we would have a commission that would include the families of the seriously mentally ill and family members of people who have experienced mental health challenges because often we hear about people with mental health challenges under two circumstances. One where they get um, arrested, injured, harmed by police, then it makes the top of the news. The other is where someone who's having a mental health crisis, maybe they're schizophrenic or psychotic or having some kind of break and they hurt somebody and they can seriously injure someone as we saw in West Oakland with the death of Dilma Spruill. Um, that makes the news, but beyond those headlines are families that have been struggling to try to respond to their loved ones in crisis and not getting the support that they need from either the district attorney's office or um, the, the courts. And so the DA's office administers about 14 different courts, alternative courts, which are intended to be diversion courts, alternatives to prosecution, and most of those courts require someone to have a mental health diagnosis or a diagnosis of either a serious mental illness or some category of mental illness that then makes them eligible for services. And when we got there, I found 10 collateral courts, collaborative courts was what they call them. They're really diversion courts and one lawyer assigned to all 10 courts. Uh, the behavioral health court had four, has four different components to it, all of which is based on mental illness. One lawyer assigned to it, no clinician from our office. Okay. Uh, and I'm saying, how are we engaging people with mental illness because we're cycling, what's been documented is that we're cycling people between John George Psychiatric Facility and Santa Rita County Jail and the streets. Those are the three places. And the district attorney's office is right in the middle of that. And so what I'm looking for from my commission is to advise us to bring voices to the table that have not been heard 
and to advise us, how do we make this system better so that it, we're having a positive impact and not a negative impact? What are we doing with people where we have 40, sometimes estimates 50% of the people in Santa Rita County Jail are suffering some form of mental illness? What are we doing about that? And the district attorney, I believe, has a role to address that. And the Mental Health uh, Advisory Commission is really key to helping us develop what our policies are, what support we provide, and what the services will be going forward. I think one of the things that might surprise the public is that um, in your first month, and normally we don't talk about like HR things, but in your first month, uh, you brought on as staff to advise and to build and to work, not just with mental health, but across the gamut as we do our work, two mental health clinicians into our office who are working with victim advocates, the Family Justice Center, they're working within the office as uh, transitions of the new office coming in, working around wellness uh, in the office. Um, what, what made you know that you wanted to do that? Because it's not something that you will typically see in a DA's office. I knew that this district attorney's office was not helping the community was not serving the community around mental health issues. So I knew that I needed to have someone from day one that had had the experience and she was a very experienced clinician that came with us initially, uh, having worked with survivors of human trafficking, worked with incarcerated people inside of San Quentin. She has had a mental health, her own personal challenges that she overcame. And she just, I knew that we needed someone with that depth of experience and a lens to help us navigate those spaces. And she's done, her name is Kelsey O'Neill. She's done a fabulous job. And then I brought on Dr. Raymond Landry, another mental health clinician uh, to help us address what, what is happening with the CARES Navigation Center, which is a diversion uh, program that the DA operates in, collaboration with behavioral health services um, that is woefully underutilized, but very fun. A lot of money is going into that facility. And it's, it is a place, the CARES Navigation Center, for those who don't know, is located in the Fruitvale District. And it's a place where police officers from around the county can bring people who may be experiencing a mental health crisis, who may have been in some type of adversarial situation, who appear to be somewhat unstable, but they don't necessarily they don't have to have a mental health diagnosis. They can just need some help, somebody to talk to. And who of us has not had a time when we have been in crisis and needed somebody just to listen? And so this is a place where that can happen, where people are getting from being brought to a situation where they can have a chance to just kind of de-escalate and then get services if they are in fact unhoused, that there's a pathway to help them get to housing, get to social services, um, and to, to really be a safety net place for people. And that's an important facility for the DA's office and for behavioral health. And so we really committed to making sure that the services that we are taxpayers are paying for that we're getting those services. Um, one of the things that is uh, that we're going to be that we're that a gift or a handing to us that we have to deal with in the office has been um, the Racial Justice Act and the idea of a lot of um, our youth resentencing initiatives. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, I know that we've staffed up because there's going to be an influx of that work because of the, the, the legislation, but can you tell us first about the Racial Justice Act and the impact that it has on the office? Sure. The Racial Justice Act impacts the entire criminal justice system. It requires us to ensure lawyers uh, and uh, my deputies to ensure that we are rooting out the racial disparities and the way that that is going to be addressed is in jury selection, in charging, uh, in sentencing, we are required by the Racial Justice Act, which was passed by the legislature to evaluate our actions through that lens because the legislature recognized that California 
like the rest of the country over incarcerates black and brown people in particularly brown people. And in Alameda County, if you're a black person, you are 20 times more likely to be incarcerated than a white person. And so that is happening, has been happening for decades through the criminal justice system. The Racial Justice Act empowers us and requires us to undo that legacy. And so we're looking forward to um, creating procedures and uh, oversight and intervening in situations where we know that race has played a role and creating the kind of uniformity uh, and non-discriminatory practices to interrupt that. And that's something that will be, is part of uh, a bureau that will include a number of different things. You mentioned resentencing. We have an opportunity and we have staffed up on the resentencing because again, the law has changed and the legislature has said that the harsh sentences that were imposed primarily on black and brown people over decades have to be undone. That is the law. And so we have to have lawyers that have been trained to prosecute people without regard to, you know, whether or not that's a, being done in a discriminatory fashion to undo those things. And so that work had started before I got there because it is the law. It's been the law now for three years. Uh, and there were a few lawyers in the unit and we brought in more lawyers and we're uh, collaborating with an educational institution and we're gonna be ramping that up because after three years, we still have just barely begun to scratch the surface. Um, one of the questions I thought was, was poignant here. Um, th they wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about um, uh, what your vision and priorities and direction that you are giving staff and the direction for the office for the next um, three to five years, or let's say six. <laughs> six years. I know. <laughs> So what are kind of what are some of the priorities and directions that you've given um, some of the staff? And, and maybe I know that we're working on um, policies to to give out uh, in, in to the world to tell people how we're restructuring and reimagining some of the the work that we do. But what are some of the initial directions that we've given folks? The first initial direction, which we absolutely felt compelled after taking the temperature in the office was to emphasize health and wellness. That people needed to, if they needed mental health support, this is where you get it. We found that there was a peer support group found formed in the office uh, that had arisen spontaneously because people seemed to be traumatized by some things that had happened. And I will, I it's, maybe not public knowledge, but there were three people who committed suicide in that office in five years. And when you walk into an organization that has been, uh, has had that happen, that's an extraordinary, those are extraordinary events. And they had an extraordinary impact on um, the people who work there. So we've emphasized health and wellness that um, we don't want people to be so overwhelmed and and we understood that the transition was challenging for some people because we were going to be making changes and bringing in new people and some people were going to be leaving and it was going to be a challenging time. So our first prior, our first directive was take care of yourself. Okay, let's let's all just slow down and take care of ourselves. And here are the resources that are available through either your private health or your county paid health insurance or through this office, through the initiative of, of people who cared about other people in the office. So that was important. Then taking the temperature again of folks about what do you need to do your job? I asked people, what is it that you like most about your job? And this was a written survey. We gave them, I think about two weeks to, maybe not that long, but more than a week to actually give us the responses. And we got an overwhelming response rate. Um, you know, over almost, I think it's more than half of the office participate. I want to know, what do you like about your job? What do you don't like about your job? What do you think you need the most to be successful? 
in your um, in your daily work. And like I said, we got good responses um, and a good sense that their people want they want more staff. The offices there's so many gaps uh, that we had to fill those gaps as quickly as we could and look at you know places where we thought were important places like behavioral health court, we should have more than one lawyer there, right? We should have, if we have 10 collateral courts, we should have more than one lawyer there. And so we began filling those spots. Um, I think it, it really has been, for me, the first six weeks is about the culture and getting the IT team together, making sure that that, that got resolved, there were issues around that. Um, you know, getting some things together that are making sure that we're consistent in how we do things. Yeah, uh, I was talking with an inspector um, when we were doing a meeting the other day, and he was telling me that right before COVID was the first time they all got the the, the setup to, in order to do Teams meetings and meet virtually, that everything had been, um, you know, everything had to be in person and that they had never really had the, that virtual meeting and then COVID happened and they said they can't imagine if that wouldn't have happened, how the, the a dead stop that the office would have come to. I think even our mm -hmm. first week that we were there, they were getting a whole new phone system so they weren't um, beholden to landlines and having an actual uh, phone. Now it goes through the computer and people have direct lines versus phones being transferred back and forth and back and forth. Um, I wanted to sh shift from the office to talking politics since we are part of a democratic club and then we get involved in things politically. I wanted to just w couple things that were questions that people asked that were office related that I wanted to circle back to. Um, sure. Something about our, our average caseload for DAs. I mean, I know the number of cases that we handle per year is 40,000. About 40,000 cases. Um, the average caseload varies depending on what unit you're in. For consumer environmental protection, it's, you know, maybe 40, 50 cases. For the process, those who are engaged in a criminal prosecution, it depends. If you have felony trials, because they're divided into different units. Some lawyers do felony trials. Some lawyers do misdemeanor trials. Some lawyers do juvenile cases. Um, so it varies across the board. I can tell you they all have too many cases. <laughs> That's what I'm, I'm real clear about. Everybody has too many cases uh, and we need more lawyers. So if you want to apply, if you know a lawyer, <laughs> send them our way. We need to hire more lawyers because there are so many cases. The office just has not grown um, in the way that it needed to. Now, having said that, our goal is to reduce the number of people who are being prosecuted through the criminal justice system. We are looking to divert more people to create um, alternative structures um, and starting to do that, just looking at how do we hold people accountable outside of the criminal justice system? Or how do we use restorative justice to give people an off ramp from the criminal justice system that in fact allows victims who are trapped in this system as much as the defendants to actually feel like they got some measure of justice from the situation. Because right now that's not happening. Um, so your election was unique and I think a lot of people missed this and there's a, a question asking about it. Um, your term instead of four years is a six year term. Um, mm -hmm. This was to realign the election for DAs and sheriffs across the state of California so that those elections would fall on presidential years. So uh, the question that they have is, um, given the fact that you get two extra years from this election, are you doing anything extra special with those two years? <laughs> Other than going to Hawaii, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't think so. I, I, I knew that it was going to be a six-year term. I was watching as the legislature was going back and forth. You know, first it was they were doing it, then they weren't doing it, then it was alive again, then the bill died. I was watching it go back and forth, and I'm like, okay, it is, it's going to be what it's going to be, and it turned out that 
they got it in, they got it done. And so, you know, I'm signed up for six years. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think it just, it's appropriate because we are engaged in transformational work and we are realigning the way that this office engages across the county. And so it's very helpful to know that we have a longer runway to get this done. And I have more time to find a successor. <laughs> Well, I would say that um, going to the campaign and political side of it, um, your campaign in 2018, I think, is what really kind of raised the stakes and the awareness of the power that a DA office plays within um, our justice system here in Alameda County. You were the first person to run against a DA since 1972. Um, uh, and then before that, the last one was uh, 1966, and the one before that was 1938. Uh, so it was a long time before that, before anyone uh, challenged an incumbent or a sitting DA, and you raised a lot of awareness in that. Um, what do you think was the difference in 2022 compared to 2028? Or 2018? So, yeah. 2018. It was a process for all of us. Um, when I ran the first time, when I launched in June of 2017, a full year before the election, no one paid us any attention at all. They were like, what? What is she talking about? Because we had not had a contested election, you know, since 1972. And at that time, as you know, that was a, a a Republican who didn't really run a robust election. And in 1966, it was a Democrat who did, who tried to run a robust election, but it was, it was Bob Truhaff and it was mainly confined to North uh, County. And so no one had run a campaign across the whole county to talk about the justice system. For me, 2018, when, when I, decided to run, I was part of a national movement to change how we do justice in this country. There were nine of us who ran in California in that election cycle. Um, and the only one who was successful was Dinah Becton in Contra Costa County. So we knew that we were changing the narrative and opening people's minds to the fact that the district attorney is an elected official and elections matter. When you don't have an election, when you don't have a contest, you don't have a conversation about how justice is done. It is the most undemocratic way of governing a major institution in this community. And that was the way that it was done since 1939. The expectation was that it would just be passed down, passed down, passed down. And so we really had to open people's eyes and their minds to the fact that this is an elected position and it does matter that the people have a voice in how, what kind of justice they want to have in, in our community, right? And that was so important. And so the difference was by 2022, people now actually understood that elections matter and this is an elected position and therefore we have a choice about what we wanna see in our justice system. I, I don't know if people realize that from 2018 to 2022, um, your, mission and your platform and your goal really didn't change um because and um there was a color of change article that came out in like 2020 that stated that they could see a difference in how our former da started to 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 implement justice in alameda county that your race in 2018 impacted that in fact it was after that was the first time that she ever held, uh, she ever charged a police officer with uh, an officer involved death. Um, and so um, what do you think is the, since your campaign really didn't change and it shifted how the office was thinking in many ways from uh, how they implemented justice to creating uh, a prosecutor's uh, uh, union, um, what, what, do you, what was different for you as far as your campaign? What did you do differently in 2022? So I think to your point, 
when we ran in 2018 and people realized that there was that the DA was an elected official, suddenly the sitting DA was realized that she was accountable to the people of this county. And so she had to look at things differently. Um, for me, coming into the 2022 campaign, what was critical to us, what we learned from the prior campaign was that we had to reach across the county. My first run, I did not have the resources or the breadth to know how to run a countywide race and you know to understand how to organize that and the amount of time that it took you know i took a year that first race this in 2022 it i took 20 months of my life that i had to put on hold to run this campaign and run it all the way across the county and that made a huge difference yeah um, I do want to recognize that you are the, the um, this is the first uh, sit down with a Democratic club that you've done since you have won um, and are in office. Yes. Um, and I will note to those who are on uh, and watching that we are not a club that endorsed you. <laughs> and you still came back to do this. Um, the votes were always close, but it just never got to that threshold. Um, there was a lot of support for you in Alameda during the primary, and it held um, into the election. Um, what is it about Alameda that you that you think that they why they voted for you? What is it that we needed? I think that certainly my experience with Alameda. You all are part of Alameda County. You're not that far away. <laughs> You're an island, but you're not that far away. <laughs> and uh, to me, the entire county is one that has embraced me um, since I came here in 1978. And I've spent time in Alameda and, you know, folks there, I know a lot of people, obviously, I was a member of your club. I've presented to this club. We've talked about racial justice issues. Um, We've had quite a few conversations uh, during the time that I've been involved in politics. And I must say, I am a proud member and former secretary of the Oakland East Bay Democratic Club. So I did go to my club first, Ryan, sorry. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> I did talk to my club first. I um, you're the first club that didn't endorse you that you went to. <laughs> oh, okay, well, I mean, I, I appreciate the value of the Democratic Club so much and the value of grassroots organized. I was a community activist and an organizer. And that's what makes, to me, this is what democracy looks like, where we all come together, people from all walks of life, we bring our views together. Everybody doesn't agree. Uh, trust me, as a secretary of my club, I have to moderate conversations <laughs> where people don't always dis always agree. And I, we brought in, we've had panels with elected officials, and I give them credit for coming to talk to my club because my club is rough. <laughs> they don't, they don't pull any punches when we call in city council members and county school board members. My club is. Woo, they're rough, but um, so I understand that it's important for elected officials to be in conversation with the community. And I think that's what resonated in Alameda uh, as well as other places around the county. I'm a member, I was a member of this club. I'm a member of Wellstone. I've been, was endorsed by the Tri-Valley Democratic Club because I go to their events. Castro Valley didn't endorse me either, but I go to Castro Valley Democratic Club because we are the lifeblood of the Democratic Party. And the Democratic Party has a role to play and a, a significant role to play in preserving our democracy. We saw the insurrection. We know that there are people who want to undermine not just the government, but our way of life, our ability to speak freely, our ability to disagree and still work together on particular issues. And so it is so important when we look at 
folks, just everyday people being able to come together in these for in this kind of a forum and in these spaces to talk about what are we, how do we feel about these issues? And so I support that wholeheartedly, whether it's it's Alameda or Livermore or <laughs> Berkeley, <laughs> I think it's so important. And I, I really do wish if I had had more time in the Democratic Party, because I did, I'm an elected member still of the Central Committee and many of you all voted for me and helped me. Alameda's always supported me. Uh, when I ran for the Central Committee the first time, Alameda said, okay, we want a smart black woman at the table. Um, and I appreciate that. I, th I think that the Democratic Party needs to do far more to support the Democratic clubs. And that would have been was one of my messages and, and would have been one of my missions if I had had more time uh, to engage the party at the party level. I think that one of the things that I've, uh, since I've been working with you that I always appreciate is that even if it's something that doesn't fall within the, the wheelhouse of what we were running for, particularly with the criminal justice system, um, we there was always a connection to it and you didn't hold back on advocating for those things. Um, a lot of times people don't see um, your advocacy around housing and the needed uh, mm -hmm. that we have for housing and how it really does affect the criminal justice system. Um, in particular, we are currently looking for housing for our folks who are um, coming back into our community from incarceration and finding beds and programs for them. Um, mm -hmm. And you were uh, not silent on that. Um, and then you were also were not silent on uh, stuff like Howard Terminal, and even and what I've always appreciated and why I enjoy so much working with you is that you uh, you always align with where your heart is on things, even mm -hmm. if it might not be politically advantageous to do so. Um, mm -hmm. And Howard Terminal is one of those examples where you're like, look, we have a community at the Coliseum that you have been ignoring for a long time and now you want to just move away from that and create something new when they have been asking for something and you aren't quiet on that what what makes you just say it without regard silence is complicity <laughs> silence is often complicity and i have been blessed to be a free black woman in this country, privileged to have a, a superior education and to have the freedom to speak my mind. And being economically uh, stable as a small business owner has given me the freedom that I'm not concerned about, you know, whether I'm going to lose business or because I represent people. And that's been you know, a foundation for me is to, for me to be able to follow my heart means that I it comes from being able to walk with people um, in their worst moments and to be an advocate for people. And when you are grounded in that, you can, it, it gives me a foundation to then walk into the political sphere and say, okay, I'm going to try to listen to people, really use my talents and my whatever skills I have to assess the situation and try to come out with what is the best outcome and advocate for that. Not, and, and know that there are opposing views. You know, our community has been divided all over the place about Howard Terminal and I wish we'll be done with it so we can stop fighting about it. Um, you know, I hope, I think in the midst of that conversation, my advocacy has been around the Coliseum because that is a major piece of real estate in this community. And I've been very clear about the value that it has and that it brings. And so that was a position that my club took and I was fully supportive of it and I've never wavered from it. And to the extent that it impacted Howard Terminal, that just happened to be where that fell. Um, I think that, you know, for someone to be able to stand in the gap for others is a privilege. It's a responsibility, it's an obligation, um, and it's an honor for me often, whether we're talking about economic development or homelessness or juvenile justice, a lot of things that I'm passionate about. Um, and I've been able 
in my lifetime to speak up about them and to think about them and then to be able to be in a position to be an advocate. So that's so important to me. Well, we are uh, very thankful that you could come tonight. Um, and uh, I know that there's a little bit of club business that they want to do. And uh, I appreciate uh, this favor that I pulled of you to come and spend an hour when I know that we have a lot going on. Um, and uh, I will see you in the office in the morning. Um, but I was going to hand and thank you again, if everyone can give a little clap. Um, thank you. I'm going to hand it. I'm going to hand it back to Zach. I think Zach had some uh, club business. And again, thank you, Pamela. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, again, I just want to say thank you to Pamela uh, for taking the time to come speak with us at the City of Alameda uh, Democratic Club and for letting us know your goals and all your plans for the next six years. I'm really excited. Um, I just want to say uh, I appreciate you, and I, I believe I speak for the whole club, that we appreciate you for coming to speak with us. Um, it's such an honor to get somebody to come and talk to us at these events. So, um, And maybe we can win you back as a member. Um, <laughs> and on that, uh, so we have some possible upcoming resolutions, maybe some possible charter changes. And so I just wanted to throw out a reminder become a member. Uh, we've been spamming the chat with the link um, so that you can vote on those charter changes on those resolutions and that we also have an open position for VP of activities um, to help us with fundraisers, help us with events, um, and we could really use it. But with that, I think if there's anyone else on the board that wants to speak, but I think um, that mostly covers it. So uh, it was a really good event. So I want to say thank you to everybody. Say thank you to Pamela. Um, Everybody, it's Thank so great to see so many faces. Keep up the work. We appreciate you. All right. Thank you so much for having me. And you guys keep up the work too. This is what democracy looks like. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Thank one you. more thing, we have to collect uh, birth dates. So look out for an email coming. Um, we're renewing our charter with the Central Committee in Alameda County Central Committee um, for our club. And one new piece of information, the um, California Democrats Org requires from us is to collect birth dates if we can. It's for logistics reasons. Um, but I will send an email out with that so we can collect some of that data. But that's all. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you for coming. <laughs>